this is an extraordinarily relevant conversation today about how to, um, you know, how to end pandemics. What are the future? What's the future of pandemics? Uh, we have lived in these last months and now almost a year through pandemic. We've also lived through insurrection, inauguration, impeachment. I hope many of you, I'm sure all of you have been watching in the impeachment. And I just wanna put in a word for someone who was one of our conversations months and months ago, Jamie Raskin. Jamie Raskin has been writing for the nation for many, many years. Uh, his father, Mark Raskin was on the editorial board of the nation for many years. And his son, his beloved son, Tommy, wrote for our 150th anniversary issue. But to see Jamie Raskin in these last hours is to remember the promise of this country. We've seen a lot of the poison. And just the other piece of it is, you know, don't forget that December 6th, January 6th, the whiplash of Georgia that morning and then the insurrection. Jimmy Tobias, who's with us, is in Michigan right now. And some of you, you know, may follow that the insurrection occupation, military occupation of a state house began in Michigan. And we were talking about it. And when you think of any science rhetoric, the, st uh, Senate, uh, the head of the Senate in the Michigan uh, State House said yesterday that the insurrection on the 6th was staged. So, you know, there's a lot going on in our conversation. Um, Jimmy uh, is someone who we met, the nation met, when we took a campus tour to Berkeley several years ago, many years ago, I think, and he was in an investigative reporting class and he and I had a chance to talk and he was at work at that time, I think, on a course paper about the sage grouse, the future of the sage grouse. And if you haven't read his brilliant piece for the nation, I'm telling you, it brings back memories. I tweeted about the white owl in Central Park the other day and several people said, we want more sage grouse. So Jimmy, you'll have to come. He said work on an important piece about extinction. I won't say of what or whom, but he follows extinction as a, the as a thesis, as a principle. I just wanna end by saying, you know, I am focused, um, I think some of you are, on what does security mean? I mean, we, this is a moment to reimagine security and I think Jimmy's work speaks to that as well. I mean, we've lived in this kind of hyper um, militarized world for too long and what good has that done in terms of fighting pandemics, in terms of the existential crisis of climate emergencies? So um, I think Jimmy's piece is enormously relevant on so many levels because we need a new way of thinking. And as um, the through line of the nation in so many ways has been, it's very hard to have real democracy at home when you're engaged in misadventures abroad, which was a real thesis of our contributing editor, Martin Luther King Jr.'s extraordinary speech about opposition to Vietnam. Um, so thank you for joining us. I wanna introduce a truly brilliant editor, Lizzie Ratner, a senior editor at The Nation. She's an extraordinary writer and has written profiles, has um, written analytical pieces. Um, she's written endorsements and editorials, which I will not discuss. She was, in fact, <laughs> she was the editor of the City's Rising series. And uh, she, you know, she edits many of the most important uh, pieces for the nation and conceives of pieces and assignments and works with uh, terrific young, medium-aged and older writers. The young one is here today, Jimmy Tobias. Mm -hmm. But thank you, Lizzie. And um, thank you, Jimmy, for being here to talk about um, not only the extraordinary cover story you did, but the other work that you're um, you know, diving into in these perilous yet hopeful times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Katrina, thank you so much for that um, humbling and overwhelming introduction. I'm, I'm blushing, felling, all sorts of emotions. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you also, also to Peter and Aaron and Gia for making this discussion today possible. Thanks to all of you out there on the other sides of your computers who are joining us for what is gonna be a wonderful talk. Uh, and conversation with one of my favorite writers, a writer I feel so lucky to work with every time I have a chance to do it, Jimmy Tobias. Um, as Katrina mentioned, we've been working with Jimmy for a while now. My work working relationship with him goes back, I'd say six and a half, seven years. 
when he approached me to do an article on the way in which oil companies were terrorizing indigenous people in Guatemala, whose land they had taken, on whose land they were encroaching, um, basically to suction and siphon off oil to power our world. And in that piece, we saw sort of the first, uh, the beginning of themes um, that have carried Jimmy through to the present moment. And those themes are the way in which capital and extraction industries and humans in general encroach on the natural world around us to the detriment certainly of the many species who share this planet with us and also to humans themselves. And since that first article, which uh, was published in 2014, Jimmy has really become, in my mind, one of the finest environmental journalists we have today. In some ways, that's too narrow a description for what he does, um, but, um, but it is a great catch-all term. Slightly more specifically, he's really become a journalist who is following closely and relentlessly on the sort of trail of or tail of the extinction crisis. This is a crisis that is up there with the climate crisis, but hasn't quite caught on in the public imagination in the same way. Um, thank you just a few words how Jimmy describes this crisis because it's gonna be really relevant to our whole talk today or his talk. So Jimmy recently wrote me um, and he said of the extinction crisis, scientists are warning the public with increasing urgency that the earth is in the midst of a mass extinction event that now threatens the existence of 1 million species from Siberian tigers to tiny Texas arachnids. As deforestation, drilling, mining, increased consumption and more continue unabated across the planet, the crisis is accelerating with dire implications for human society itself. Sobering words. Um, and I should say, you know, Jimmy has been on this case where so few others have been for a long time. Now, about a year ago, Jimmy became interested in another crisis, um, a crisis that many of us have become aware of and have begun to follow, and that is the pandemic, the crisis of COVID-19. What made Jimmy's um, interest unusual is that his interest or sort of awareness of what was happening and about to happen really predates that of many people. All the way back in late January and February, when Donald Trump was promising us that the an epidemic which is a terrible project when our own leaders in this city when uh corporate leaders were saying it's going to be no worse than the flu this is no big deal jimmy and i were having regular conversations saying what on earth is going on this is terrifying terrifying by the way have you started you know hoarding food what are you doing about this what's going to happen no one seems to be in control now as it happened and as we would sort of he would come to discover these two crises that seemed so disparate and that really were preoccupying, preoccupying him, the extinction crisis, environmental crisis, and COVID, they turn out to be intimately, inextricably linked. And it is that connection which is beginning to get attention, but which I think not enough people understand, that is going to be the beginning of our talk today. And that is really the basis for this article he wrote a few weeks back, Can We Prevent the Next Pandemic? And so in order to really explore this article, Jimmy, I wanna now turn to you and ask you, um, what is the connection between these two crises that you have been paying attention to with such intensity, COVID-19 on the one hand and the extinction crisis slash the kind of environmental crisis created by human impacts on the environment? Sure, yeah, well, thanks, thanks a lot for the introduction, Lizzie. Um, you know, I think the first kind of definition to put out there is, is, the, is the definition of the phrase zoonotic disease. Um, some of you probably are familiar with it, but zoon that's the name. Zoonotic disease is the name that scientists have given to viruses and other microbes that spill from animals, from animal populations into human populations and cause disease. So for example, you're familiar with Lyme disease, which spills into the human population from ticks uh, you're familiar with HIV AIDS, which first spilled into the human population from chimpanzees. Um, and then of course there's COVID-19, which likely originated in bats and spilled into the human population from bats or from an another animal host. Um, and so from Ebola to Zika, to Marburg, to the Nipah virus, new zoonotic diseases 
um, continue to regularly spill into the human population from wild animals. Um, they have zoonotic diseases have accounted for two thirds of all human pathogens discovered since 1980. Um, and yeah, according to a 2015 paper, there's actually over 1 billion cases of human zoonotic disease every year. And they're estimated to cause a huge amount of, of economic damage. And that's before COVID. Um, so, you know, disease has always been with us, obviously, um, and zoonotic diseases have as well. But scientists have stated clearly that, uh, that these deadly new zoonotic pathogens are on the rise, threatening outbreaks and epidemics and pandemics. Um, and that's the new, that's our new norm. And uh, a UN, uh, a UN backed panel of international scientists last year uh, called our era the pandemic era. Um, and so, why? Like, why are these diseases on the rise? Why are we living in a pandemic era? Um, and it's, it's happening because we're destroying the planet because of environmental destruction um, and disruption. And that, that's kind of the key fact that I think, you know, some people are definitely aware of, but it's sort of been overlooked in the discussion about COVID 19. Um, but, but scientists are very clear, you know, when you look at their papers, things like land use change, like deforestation, um, road building, um, agricultural expansion, uh, urban sprawl. Uh, these are the, the principal drivers of, of new zoonotic disease emergence in the world of, of spillover. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just going to read a quote real quick from the Wildlife Conservation Society, which really focuses on this issue. And they said, rapid and profound socio-ecological changes are driving a species extinction crisis while severely impacting the health of people, wildlife, domesticated animals, and plants. This is happening not in a remote landscape or in some distant future, but right here and right now. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the core of the message, I'd say. So, Jimmy, I'm wondering, um, that is harrowing and frightening. Um, and resonant and makes a lot of sense. I'm wondering though, if you could walk us now through um, how this works, you know, take us through a viral spillover event that then becomes a, an illness that humans experience. Yeah, you know, well, one classic example is, is Lyme disease, which emerged in sort of degraded New England forests where people were moving in and um, scrambling the ecosystem allowing for a pro proliferation of Lyme disease carrying rodents. So that's one example. But the, probably the example that I think best captures the dynamics at play is, is the story of the Nipah virus, which first emerged in Malaysia in 1998. And what happened there was that, um, you know, pig farmers and farmers were building, you know, new, new pig enclosures and new, new projects in forests where bats lived, where fruit bats lived. I mean, so they were kind of, you know, moving into this natural habitat, bringing with them pigs, um, planting mango trees next to the pig enclosures. And so then a bunch of bats started hanging out, eating these mango trees, and they would drop pieces of mango that, you know, covered in their saliva into the pig pens. And then the pig pens picked up this virus from the bats and the, the virus ended up getting into into humans um, and something like 260 people got sick, 150 died. There was a case fatality rate of somewhere around 75% for this disease. And it was a really big scare. And, and it just really illustrates the way that this disease moved from bats who kind of, whose habitats kind of got messed up by people pushing in. Uh, it moved from bats to pigs and then people and a bunch of people died. Um, and, and it's still, there are still regular outbreaks of Nipah in places like Bangladesh. Um, but that, you know, that really captures, I think, the, 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 the way it, these spillover events happen. So um, in the story that you write, uh, that you wrote for The Nation, um, you went on to discuss how scientists were able to intervene in the Nipah virus outbreak. Um, and, uh, and you connect it a new scientific approach or philosophy or even movement, you call it, called One Health. So I, would, I was wondering if you could explain to us now, scientists know this is a problem. Also, according to your arguments, sometimes some scientists are coming up with solutions. Right. Can you describe One Health and how it's a solution? Yeah, there's this movement afoot among scientists and 
doctors and public health practitioners and wildlife conservationists uh, called the one called one health the one health movement and you know given the facts of the threats we face from zoonotic disease and you know the COVID-19 experience especially um, these people say we need a new approach to medicine and public health one that integrates the health of animal populations and the planet um, together um, and you know the, these these one health advocates put put out a manifesto kind of last year called the Berlin Principles and they said that we are starkly reminded of the fact human, animal, plant, and environmental health uh, are in, in, intrinsically connected. Um, and, and so that's sort of, that's just sort of the, the core of the message. Uh, this, this movement understands that environmental destruction has, has caused this lethal new normal, this pandemic era that we're all experiencing right now in such a profound, tangible way. Um, and so, yeah, they, they want to put this practice, this vision in practice and, and incorporate planet, planetary and animal health into sort of the realms of public health. Um, and obviously it's, it's very urgent given, given what we're experiencing now. So it sounds almost like the ultimate um, medical or scientific or health approach for the era of environmental crisis in yeah. certain ways. Um, the ultimate, I think, I can't remember exactly how you phrased it in your piece, but sort of the ultimate 21st century public health, environmental health program. Um, so what does this look like in practice? You know, um, we have these kind of abstract ideas of environmental, veterinary, epidemi epidemiology, public health, all merging. But what is like, is this actually happening and what does it look like on the ground? Yeah, there's been some very interesting um, efforts to sort of put this One Health idea into practice. Um, one of them was a federally funded effort. It was like a $200 million program for 10 years called the PREDICT program that sent scientists around the world. You know, it was, it was a partnership between the government, universities, nonprofit organizations, including a couple in New York City. And they basically sent scientists around the world to search for new um, potential pathogens that kind of reside in, you know, in the veins of animals. They would sample animals, try to find new, new, um, new viruses. They discovered new coronaviruses in China through this program. They discovered um, all sorts of new potential pathogens in Africa and Latin America um, and Southeast Asia. Um, and, you know, they were trying to basically build out our understanding of the way that zoonotic disease happens. So a lot of the papers I referenced early in the talk grew out of out of this program. So they really got a grasp. They really started to understand the way that um, viruses spill into the human population and can cause all this damage. Um, unfortunately, that program was shuttered by the Trump administration um, and and it never really got to meet its true potential, or at least that's what some of my sources told me for the story. But you know they accomplished a great deal. They really got a grasp on this, like a grasp, an understanding for the first time of of the true threat that people face from these um, these potential pathogens. Um, and another program that I, another example of of One Health in Action that I find really interesting and that we reference in the story took place in San Antonio, Texas, in 2013. There, there there's this huge um, bat cave right outside San Antonio called the Bracken um, Preserve. Um, and it's, it's actually home to the largest population of bats in the world, um, migratory bats that travel between Texas and Mexico. Um, and in 2013, this real estate developer wanted to build like a really dense um, project right at the edge of this bat cave. Um, and like bat conservationists were really worried about this project because they're like, oh, the bats are gonna have all these problems with humans and some local politicians were really worried about it. And so they hired, um, one of the groups we profile in the story, the EcoHealth Alliance, to send their scientists down to San Antonio to really do a study of like what what impact um, this this new residential development would have, not just on the bats and on environmental quality, but on human health, because um, because obviously bat people are, of all people are very aware of of the dangers of zoonotic disease, and so they put together this report that found that if this residential community had been built next to this bat cave the city would have had to prepare to, for an increase in animal control needs, an increase in public health needs. They would need to be prepared for an increase in rabies. And the report also mentioned that these bats, these Mexican free-tailed bats that live outside of San Antonio also carry coronaviruses. 
Um, and so it's an example of the way, like if we were doing development in this country or anywhere in a way that actually took into account the threat, you know, that species disruption poses to public health, this is the sort of approach that we could take um, to really look at the way that a development project, a mine, a road could lead to, you know, instances of spillover um, from, from wild animals to people. So those are both two ways that this idea has been put into practice in recent years. And, and um, I think that San Antonio example in particular, I don't know, really spoke to me about the way we might start thinking about um, um, our approach to development and economic you know, growth or whatnot. And Jimmy, just to, um, if my memory's correct, the, in the San Antonio example, the city ended up doing some interesting thing where they bought the land, they sort of created some trust or fund. Can you tell me they ended up buying the land so that it wasn't developed? How did that work exactly? Yeah, yeah, they, they ended up not, the, the real estate project didn't move forward. The city partnered with conservationists and others to buy up the property that they wanted to build this thing on because they were so concerned about the impact on human health and, and, and other things as well. But, and, and the person who ended up, um, who led that charge, the local politician um, ended up, uh, his name's Ron Nuremberg, he ended up becoming mayor. And, and he told me in, in a call that, you know, his, his brokering of this deal was one of the reasons he thinks he got elected. Got it. So good for animals, good for the environment, good for humans and good for political careers even right. potentially. Yeah. Um, you know, the case of PREDICT is interesting to me because as you discussed, um, scientists have been, you know, we're out there in the world studying viruses, studying their potential for spillover and then causing sickness. Um, and my sense is that they were working not merely to identify, but then ultimately to try to interrupt or prevent the spillover of disease. But then the Trump administration canceled the funding for it. Um, so this seems like a moment perhaps to talk about the ways in which the Trump administration's kind of anti-science ethos affected our pandemic preparedness. You talk about this specifically in the story, um, one very specific event in addition to the PREDICT program. Um, I'll just say that like a lot of you out there who are part of the conversation today are probably all too aware of the way in which the Trump administration's anti-science ethos led to... Um, Obviously, it's the vaccine rollout led to the botched testing rollout, led to the anti mask um, sort of attack. But it uh, to other ways in which the anti science ethos really undermine our ability to prepare for pandemics. So I turn it back to you with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, one of the, the the incident we kind of start this story with um, took place right kind of in the beginning of the um, pandemic. There was a press conference uh, at the White House, and um, there was this sort of this conspiracy theory going around at the time, and it's still very much alive that the coronavirus like was the result of a lab accident in China, um, and that the Obama administration had given a grant to this particular lab. So there was all this, you know, um, talk about that. What really happened was one of the main One Health groups in the United States is a group called the Eco Health Alliance. They're based in New York. They've got great scientists. They're the ones who went to San Antonio. They were deeply involved in the PREDICT program. And they worked in China with the Wuhan, with, with a lab in Wuhan and elsewhere to study the coronaviruses that are regularly circulating in, through human populations in China. Um, and, and so, you know, when this conspiracy theory kind of popped up, they were a target of it. They got attacked like in, online, doxxed, things like that. Um, and Trump sort of embraced this conspiracy theory and, and their grant, the EcoHealth Alliance is like $3.7 million grant working in China and elsewhere to study coronaviruses and other um, potential pathogens. Um, was abruptly canceled by the National Institutes of Health, like just like a few days after this press conference in April 2020. Um, and it was just a very egregious, like anti-scientific, politically driven decision by the National Institutes of Health. Um, and the Eco Health Alliance was outraged. All, all sorts of US-based scientists were outraged. They said it totally messed up the federal program, like the federal procedures for providing scientific grants. And um, 
Peter Zazak, who's the president of the Eco Health Alliance, called on the and still has called on the um, director of the NIH, the NIH, to resign over this sordid incident. Um, but the director of the NIH, Francis Collins, was actually just reappointed by Biden to continue at the NIH. So, I mean, there's a lot there that I think um, still needs to be explored through public records requests to get to the bottom of why the NIH made this decision and canceled their grant because of this conspiracy theory. But it was just a very potent example of the way that like people who are trying to do this One Health work, you know, are running up definitely against a certain degree of, um, you know, sort of consp conspiracy theories, sort of entrenched opposition to this idea, and sort of the, the xenophobia that's inherent in most discussions of zoonotic diseases. I mean, even the name of uh, these diseases are often kind of, you know, a reflection of, of, of fear of foreigners as, as you know, Trump's, Trump calling the, the pandemic, the China virus is obviously a particularly toxic example, but it's sort of embedded in the discussion. So, so yeah, that, that was one instance. Um, and now, you know, thankfully Trump and his anti-science ethos in theory are gone. But um, as you pointed out, uh, Collins is still at the NIH. So do you have a sense of what we can expect from Biden or, or at least what has happened um, in recent months around some of these One Health efforts in the United States? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the Biden uh, administration's approach is gonna be here. I mean, obviously I think they have a much more like um, healthy respect for scientific expertise when it comes to these sorts of issues. Um, I will say that, like, in terms of new developments, um, the Peter Daszak and the EHA were, were finally recently able to go back to China on that um, WHO mission um, to explore the origins of this pandemic. And they came back with a report very a couple of days ago that they said it was extremely unlikely that this pandemic was the result of a lab accident. And in fact, uh, um, a scientific paper published in Nature Communications this week found um, closely related viruses to COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, circulating in bats and pang pangolins in Southeast Asia. So I think the evidence is, is, you know, people are still searching for the origins of this virus, but I think, um, you know, this week we got a little closer to understanding the, the origin story. Right. And, and of course, as you pointed out at the beginning of the conversation, spillover events happen all the time. They've happened throughout human history, um, while, you know, whether it's bubonic plague, bacterial rather than viral, but nonetheless is the result of the spillover from animals to humans um, or other illnesses, like I believe, you know, typhoid or um, originally measles. Like there's all every, you know, most of the diseases we have are the results of spillovers. So we shouldn't be shocked when we happen to see it again in our midst. It's sort of Occam's razor, um, probably comes from an animal, not from right. some, Wuhan lab type of conspiracy um, type of situation. Um, and so, uh, you know, in terms of predict has its funding back or what what's happening exactly? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I don't think predict has been revived yet. Um, Biden did promise to do so. So um, I think it's a little too early. I don't think that's happened, but the the USAID, which was the federal agency that was directing Predict, it did launch a, a new program called Stop Spillover, which is tr sort of trying to take what Predict learned and use it to prevent spillover um, in in international communities and elsewhere. But you know, I think people involved in Predict would say that there's still definitely a need for like that, just that initial research work, like still trying to get a sense of the viruses out there that threaten us. I mean, this pathogen that, that's causing COVID-19 was, you know, was unknown to us. But if, if Predict had started five years earlier, if more, you know, if it had more resources, who knows, maybe they would have found it first and been able to, um, you know, alert people to the dangers and start to prepare vaccines. Like a lot of, um, a lot of the, the pathogens I, I've mentioned like NEPA, um, like NEPA for instance, is on a list by the World Health Organization for like preventative vaccine production to make vaccines now should 
you know, should the virus mutate, become more transmissible and cause a pandemic sometime in the future. So there, like those are like, that's like sort of where I think in, that's one direction that the One Health Movement wants to go, like preventative, like preventative research, vaccine production, things like that, that can help us prepare if we're gonna be living through a pandemic era. And then the other side of it is sort of like really focusing on the need for like wildlife conservation and habitat conservation and keeping humans out of the constant close interaction with disturbed animal populations that um, that really lead to these spillover events in the in the first place, and that's where I'm most interested because like that's where this issue kind of intersects with the extinction crisis. Like you know, th there are a million species that are going to be facing extinction in the future, many in the coming decades, um, and as these animals get wiped out, that's a sign that their habitats are getting wiped out, that humans are encroaching, and so it's sort of a um, it's sort of a sign that like the, you know, the extinction crisis and the and pandemics are, are sort of intertwined in that way. And so I think um, that's another area where there's really a lot of work to do. Um, and that's why the San Antonio example spoke to me because it was a good example of the way of the of forward thinking on that particular element of this problem. Yeah, and in terms of the San Antonio example, I mean, I think one way you framed it so beautifully in the article, which again, I encourage everybody to read, um, if you haven't already. But, um, you know, we tend to think of pandemics as beginning elsewhere, for whatever reason, probably xenophobia, American exceptionalism, you know, pandemics, these spillover events happen in these other foreign exotic places. But uh, as the, you know, San Antonio example points out, as Lyme disease makes really clear, we obviously have spillover events all the time, really close to home. Um, and along those lines, just one thing also, which you point out in the article, but we don't have time to talk much about here, um, but there are other ways in which human encroachment on the environment um, cause really significant effect, um, you know, bacterial sort of spillover and things like that. So whether it's E. coli um, or antibiotic resistance, these are other areas where human actions are having effects and where One Health can come in and play a role. So before we take questions from others, I have one more question for you, Jimmy, which is um, you've done such a beautiful job of explaining One Health to us. And I'm still curious about how established is One Health? Like, is it kind of this avant-garde movement at this point, or is it fairly entrenched in our major institutions? Like, where's it at? Yeah, I mean, I think it's somewhere in between that. I mean, I, I think a lot of people, um, it's becoming more and more, people are becoming more and more aware of it. There's a strong community behind it, you know, like UC Davis has a One Health Institute, you know, th this idea is taking root in universities. Um, the National Park Service has a One Health program that's like looking at potential spillover threats on public lands in the United States. Um, the CDC has a One Health office. I mean, th this is starting to kind of take root uh, in national governments and international institutions, universities. There's various nonprofits and, and things like that involved in this work around the world. Um, but I do think that like before this pandemic, it was not something that people really necessarily saw the urgency of. Um, and I think that this experience is going to really supercharge um, this idea uh, because everyone now is experiencing the consequences of our failure to take these warnings seriously. And there, there have been many warnings for many years about the threat of a pandemic and the threat that our, and, and, and the, the consequences of our constant destruction of the natural world everywhere. Um, you know, and, and so we're seeing that. And, you know, that's apart from even climate change, like this is a, a different issue, although of course they're all related, but um, so yeah, I think, I, think, I think it will grow tremendously after this experience, I imagine, and probably reach, you know, new levels of, of institutional um, success, I guess. So that's a perfect moment to open up to a question um, from one of our listener viewers out there. Um, Alice asks, are there any politicians who get this stuff? Who in government is working most effectively to prevent future pandemics? So it's, it's kind of sort of a more 
honed version of my question. Like, is there any champion out there in our government who is pushing this? You know, I, I, I like when, when you say like, is there a champion? Like no one like comes to mind as like a really like visionary champion necessarily. I will say like who, you know, who, that's their like main thing on the Hill or whatever. But I, um, Tina Smith, the Senator from Minnesota, um, she has, has a bill before Congress with one of her Republican colleagues um, to institutionalize a One Health program across the government. I mean, she spoke to us for our story. And um, so she, I mean, there is active interest, no doubt among politicians. And I'm sure that it's growing given what we're experiencing. But I wouldn't say like, I, I you know, when I think of like really the the face, the faces of One Health Movement, I, really, I think more of, of like the scientists who are associated with groups like the Wildlife Conservation Society and the Eco Health Alliance and organizations like that. Like they've really been um, carrying this flag forward for years. I mean, really for years. Um, and, and, you know, if you wanna, in terms of like, if you wanna read a great book on this topic, I would, I would recommend the book Spill. Hey, Jimmy, maybe reboot. Hi, all. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. I Thanks. think I'm all right. Sorry, my computer froze and now poor Jimmy froze um, because such is our era. Oh, you're back. Yay. I'm Welcome back, back Jimmy. Can you hear me okay or am I freezing a lot? No, it was only that one time and okay. I also froze. Okay. So, um, but welcome back. I nice was just going to say again. before I cut off, if you really want to read a great book on this topic, um, I would highly recommend the book Spillover by David Quammen, which really explores zoonotic disease and their impact on human history over the years from HIV to, I mean, COVID wasn't in it because it, it's like five, 10 years old, but um, you know, there, there have been leaders and people um, discussing this for years. So, so yeah. So, we have another question um, for you uh, from Ann Martin, who asks, how can we tie this together with climate change? Will climate change increase the chance of pandemics in the future? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I, I you know, I don't cover climate change as much as, as some, I really focus on the extinction crisis, but they're very much intertwined. I mean, you know, climate change from sea level rise to acidifying oceans, um, are going to put a lot of species at risk of extinction. Um, and, you know, I think when you have like beleaguered animal populations, um, especially beleaguered animal populations that are struggling to survive or maybe starving or hungry or struggle, you know, or just unhealthy, you know, I, I imagine that it's easier for health problems to take root. Um, and when those populations come into contact with humans, um, that's, that's how you get these spillover events. So, you know, as, as wildlife suffers from the various impacts of climate change, I think, uh, and, and as people are driven to more extremes to obtain the resources they need to survive, I think that, um, you know, th these, these sorts of spillover events are probably likely to increase. And that's why it's so urgent to take, to tackle these issues right now before, um, before our various environmental catastrophes get worse. Um, you know, uh, there's another question, which is not so much a question actually as a statement, but I think it's something that you elaborated on in your article and I'd love you to say more here. Um, Jacob Rabbit, just in the chat wrote, pro-science is anti-profit. Um, and at the end of your article, you talk about the way in which all the different ways that One Health is so obvious, so logical. Um, it's likely to face challenges, um, not simply from kind of anti-science Trumpers, but from other people, you know, people who may be pursue profit. Could you talk a little bit about the way in which um, we might need to change a lot more uh, than sort of just simple public health in order to implement One Health and stop future pandemics? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I um, I write a lot about the Endangered Species Act, which is an incredibly popular law. Um, but uh, but whenever it's try whenever the government tries to enforce it, it faces like incredible backlash from all sorts of corporate commercial interests, ideological groups, whatever. Um, and and that's the case for any kind of regulation. And and you know, so I think. As, as One Health takes root in governments and as they and as these governments try to um, find ways to implement protections um, that can address the, the, you know, the deeper causes of these pandemics, I imagine they will um, bump up against, you know, entrenched interests uh, who don't want to change, you know, their economic models to prevent, you know, some pandemic from happening in the future. You know, so I just think there, there's there's this. Um, I mean, I think everyone who's paying attention knows that like our model of economic growth is destroying the planet, and it's climate. It's causing climate change. That's one big problem, <laughs> but it's also causing this sort of thing: extinction, disease emergence. Um, and if we're going to survive on the planet, <laughs> it's really like incumbent upon everyone to to integrate this information into their approach. And that, that means our economic models are, are gonna need to change one way or the other. And they can either change with the cooperation of people in the business world, or they're gonna change in another way. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, you know, everyone has been saying that from Pope Francis to, you know, the DSA. <laughs> So uh, that's the obviously kind of um, necessarily bracing and less hopeful approach, but one we have to grapple with. Um, however, we have a question from Joseph Parker who asks, how is the One Health model informed by ecological theory? And is there anything from our knowledge of ecosystems um, and their recovery that might provide some hope for our public health future? Thank you, Joe, my kind housemate, for asking that question. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the whole um, the whole One Health model is based on, I think, you know, the the tenets of ecology. I mean, disease ecology is the is the discipline that has really led to the emergence of our understanding of the way that these um, pathogens spill from from animal populations to human populations and there's a really rich beautiful um literature of uh, about disease ecology which you know which that book spilled the spillover which i mentioned before by david Quammen, really gets into to the science behind this whole field um and you know i think you know the, the, another realm of ecology is restoration ecology uh and it's sort of rooted in the hope that we can restore the ecosystems we've destroyed and um and chart a different path forward from our past and i think that both of those fields of ecology are very much sort of um inherent in this discussion so I keep on muting and unmuting myself, so apologies for the pauses. Um, there's actually a natural follow-up question to this um, from Barbarina Heyerdahl, who asks, any thoughts on the value of rewilding projects that take degraded landscapes uh, and help them reestablish biodiversity and how it could help with the One Health framework? Even things as simple as planting native wildflowers and shrubs and trees in small years can cause an explosion of pollinator and bird populations in urban and suburban neighborhoods. So uh, any thoughts on that sort of very specific approach to uh, to recovering our ecosystems? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think when, when the natural world is left alone, it usually does a pretty good job of recovering itself. And um, one of the things we mentioned in the story and an idea that's really gaining traction is, is EO, the biologist E.O. Wilson's idea of, of half earth, which is to like, to basically to set aside half of the planet's land mass for wild animals um, to regain their foothold and have healthy um, populations and the opportunity to survive and thrive into the future alongside the billions of humans on this planet. Um, and I think, uh, and, and that, that idea also has, has a lot of potential to, to help create buffers, I think, between um, human populations and these diseases that linger in wild animals. 
And it, it also is gaining traction. I mean, the Biden administration is committed to pr protecting 30 percent of Americans uh, of this country's land and water by 30 of a 2030. It's like their 30 by 30 commitment. Um, and so, you know, there, there is a movement among um, in the conservation community, the environmental community to um, set aside more land to protect um, to protect people from disease. And, you know, the Bracken Cave is a, a perfect example that that cave was set aside by an independent conservation group. But um, if it uh, if it hadn't been, you can imagine what might have already happened, you know, people building right next to it, um, disease outbreaks outside of San Antonio. So, you know, you can see with that example, the way that like land preservation and proper planning and proper analysis can all kind of lead the way to an approach that doesn't just heedlessly destroy wildlife habitat and put us all at risk for these uh, deadly diseases. So that also leads really beautifully um, into a question asked by another of our participants. Um, so John Babbitt, who I fear I might have misread your name initially and called you John Rabbit, apologies, um, asks, what can individual citizens do to help support the One Health movement? You know, do you have thoughts? Should we be reaching out and letting our politicians know, getting involved with organizations? What can we do? Yeah, I mean, definitely both of those things. You know, I think reading about disease ecology, you know, COVID is on everyone's mind because we're all living through it every day. And so I think um, coming to grips with the, the backstory of it, the, the disease ecology component of it, I think is just like a really interesting experience and will help put it all in context because it's such a confusing time. Um, and then with that knowledge, you know, I think it's, it's easier to be informed about the way these, these problems develop and emerge. But definitely like supporting groups, you know, like the Eco Health Alliance or the Wildlife Conservation Society, if, if you're inclined to, is a good way to support this sort of work. I think um, making your representatives aware of these problems is, is always good. You know, I think there's a lot of focus on the climate crisis as there should be right now, but the extinction crisis um, doesn't get the attention it deserves. And even though they're interrelated, they're not the same thing. Um, and the extinction crisis is happening all over the country. Uh, so many species are at risk right now. And uh, I think that is something everyone can get involved in in their own backyard. Um, and, and by addressing the extinction crisis, I think we would be addressing really some of the root causes of, of this pandemic era and, and these continual outbreaks that are putting so many lives at risk. Um, all right. Well, that will give me, I need to do more myself. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, thank you for the question and thank you for the answer. Um, I now have a question from our very own Gia, who asks, um, are there or what are some examples of indigenous groups who are working with One Health? And what are the unique challenges that they face when it comes to zoonotic diseases? Yeah, you know, I, I was looking, um, I saw that in, in Alaska, there's several uh, tribal governments that are working on One Health programs. I think that's an area that would actually be really ripe for um, its own article to really explore the, the, the um, yeah, just the relationship between like indigenous history and the concepts that are sort of embedded in One Health, which aren't really like new to One Health so much. You know, this idea that the planet and human health are all intertwined. Like that's something that I think a lot of cultures have sort of implicitly understood and put into practice in the past. Um, but yeah, I, I would say like, honestly, th that, that that question would be the basis for a really good article of one's own or an exploration or a research project. Because I think, you know, there's a lot of um, indigenous groups around this country who are doing really incredible work to protect the environment. You know, obviously Standing Rock is an example, but in Utah, there's the tribal coalition behind the Bears Ears National Monument. There's um, the Indigenous Environmental Network, there's the opposition to pipelines in, in um, Michigan and Minnesota. I mean, there, there's really no end of examples of Indigenous groups that are working to protect wildlife and restore wildlife. Um, the degree to which those efforts have been merged with public health at this time, I don't really know. And I think that that's a really interesting, rich question. Um, I mean, certainly, one Health has outposts all over the world, and it seems like 
uh, One Health groups work very closely with other groups around the world. But I think what you're getting at is something even more interesting and deeper, which is the way that indigenous groups can uh, be leading and feeding these efforts. Because um, as you point out in your article also, while the ideas of behind One Health might feel really fresh to us, there are a lot of cultures and societies that have understood this for a very long time and sort of uh, the scientific community in certain ways is coming to it almost late if one wants to think about it um, that, that way. Um, so another question, um, Alana asks, is the animal rights movement aligned with One Health? You know, that's a really great question. And I think, you know, I think there's a huge opportunity, honestly, to sort of merge the concerns of like wildlife conservationists and animal rights activists who usually are more focused on um, like the negative effects of agribusiness and domestic and the, you know, the plight of domestic animals. And I have often felt that like those two groups really, there, there seems to be like a missing connection there between those two groups to really approach the extinction crisis um, because, you know, like the way that climate activists, one of the things they've done so well over the years is to link climate change to things like, um, you know, wildfires or bad hurricanes or flooding. And I think the extinction, the people who are concerned about the extinction crisis haven't had as much success in linking that concern with, you know, more human daily impacts. And these disease outbreaks are a really good way to make that connection. And obviously, um, you know, as the NEPA example showed with, with the pigs that were infected, you know, agribusiness has a connection here between um, in the spread of these pathogens, you know, like swine flu, avian flu, other, other zoonotic diseases that sort of originate on, um, on big farms where, you know, animals are confined and held in terrible conditions. So I think there's a huge opportunity to kind of um, connect the dots. And I, I haven't really seen it happen, but I do know that One Health Advocates are not just concerned about wild animals, they're also concerned about the effects of, um, you know, industrial farming and things like that in the, you know, in the cultivation of new pathogens. So now we have a, com a question, which I have no idea of the answer to, and so I'm deeply intrigued by. It's by James Obar, and the question is, any conversation anywhere going on about holding politicians and bureaucrats accountable for anti-science, anti-public health decisions by using quote unquote reckless endangerment as the legal theory. One of many times I wish I'd gone to law school. <laughs> yeah, right. Should have done that. We need a lawyer for that one maybe. Yeah, um, I know. I do think, you know, I think some of the people who, I'm just speaking from the area that I cover most, which is the Endangered Species Act and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Which, which is the federal agency that enforces that law. And I know that there are um, efforts by some groups to hold the people who uh, were involved in some of the most egregious rollbacks of environmental regulations um, accountable for their actions during the last four years. Even if just, you know, with through, through inspectors general and whatnot, but there are efforts, I think, at that sort of thing. But reckless endangerment, I'm not sure about that. Um, so we are approaching the end of our conversation. And so I wanted to kind of turn it back to you for final reflections, Jimmy, that you have. Um, you know, we've had uh, people asking us what we can do, people asking um, whether you're optimistic or what Biden can do, will do. And so I, I guess I'm wondering if you have any kind of closing, closing thoughts for us on One Health, this pandemic era that we've entered, extinction, you know, what what it is, what is it that we must take with us as we leave today? Yeah, well, in terms of optimism, you know, I, I sort of am optimistic because I think this experience of COVID has so shaken up our cultural assumptions and just our assumptions as humans about our place in the world that it's impossible to say what the downstream impacts of that will be. But I imagine that there's going to be all sorts of experimentation and new ideas emerging in the years to come after this very painful experience. Um, and so I hope that some of these ideas really start to take root because if, you know, we really need to learn from this experience, which has been so devastating. Um, yeah, and, um, you know, I think there, there's lots that people can do. Uh, I think one thing is just like, 
when you have the opportunity, like th there hasn't been a huge discussion of this element of COVID-19, you know, because the human toll has been so enormous and the pain has been so enormous and the political failures to address this have been so terrible that I think the origins of this pandemic have been overshadowed. And, you know, that makes a lot of sense. But I do think it's important to carry um, the real story of these origins forward so that we can avoid this experience in the future. And that's a little bit what we were trying to do in this story and others have as well. Thank, uh, Jimmy, I'm going to turn it over to Katrina in a second, but I want to thank you so much and thank you to everybody who's been here today. Um, whether you know it or not, I hope you realize that at this point you've listened to somebody who's really prophetic, who for years has been talking not only about the extinction crisis we need to heed, but well before so many others understood that COVID-19 would be a catastrophe from which we would struggle to recover for a long time. So heed his words because um, I think they'll be coming back to us many times in the future. And now, thank, thank you, you, Katrina. I hand it back to you. Thanks, thank Lizzie. you, Lizzie. I was gonna, I was gonna use that word, prophetic. Um, but I'm also grateful to you, Jimmy, for being so cogent, for being um, deeply informative, uh, human, humane, and also accessible as you talk about what are very deep ideas and concepts. And I want to say I learned something from every nation conversation, but I really learned this time about. One Health Movement, the urgency of it. I think you assigned a story. We should do something in Alaska, indigenous peoples. And the extinction crisis and its link to the pandemic, uh, zoonotic diseases. I mean, these are all ideas that you've worked in, toiled in the field, but so many don't know. And thank you also for giving us ideas about literature, not only your articles, which everyone should read, but the Spillover book. And you mentioned there's some literature, maybe in the chat, you might add one or two things about disease ecology. Uh, we have done a piece, I think, on rewilding. Barbarina's on the call. We did a rewilding piece and may do more in light of Jimmy's interest. And um, just want to thank you very much. And it's exciting to work with journalists like Jimmy. And I don't mean to go from the sublime prophetic to, but if you, know, you can help support us, it helps us support great reporting like Jimmy's, which is really, I think you don't see very much. Uh, I also want to invite you and thank you, Jimmy, and thank you, Lizzie, for superb moderating. Um, Helen Prejean is going to be with us on the 24th of February, and we're going to put in the chat a link. Uh, she is the extraordinary uh, death penalty abolitionist, and she has written a piece in our last issue, which she'll be talking about in addition to the work, extraordinary work she's done over these many decades. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank truly, uh, really, really interesting and clear and makes us understand how little we know and how much we need to know in terms of coming back, not to a new normal, but to kind of a reconstruction rest, you know, of our planet. So thanks everyone for joining and um, thank you.